Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is the Scarborough Town Council, Wednesday, November 20th, regular meeting. Um, the first order of business is just called to order, which I've done. The next order of business is Pledge of Allegiance. But before we do that, we have some special guests this evening. I understand we have Troop 47 here, and I think they'd like to come up and introduce themselves to us. And so we would welcome you to come to the podium and tell us a little bit about yourselves. And then they're going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Hi, guys. You guys can tell jokes if you want. <laughs> why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, Lucas, you want to start? These are Scouts for 47, part of our citizenship in the community merit badge, attending a oh, town meeting. Uh, so that's why we're here tonight. Nice. That's probably the only reason they're here. Today. <laughs> <laughs> now, Peter. <laughs> um, who's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Are you all going to do it? Or? Flag? Who's going to start it off? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. And then a little, uh, we, d we also have another special guest here tonight. I saw her go toward the back room, Katie. Would you like to kind of come forward? So. <laughs> Katie, we'd just like to thank you for your patience and understanding over the last couple of years. A flat of flowers to you. It's so many. <laughs> I think we, we kind of partnered together to kind of do this. I may have talked you into being part of the council. I really appreciate it. I learned so much from you in the years that you've been here. Thank you. I think you've made us great leadership, and thank you for moving us through a lot of difficult times. Your sage wisdom was very helpful. And I don't know if others would like to say anything to Katie, but really appreciate you helping us out. Yeah, sure. I, I'd like to add, you know, we didn't know each other before I started serving, and we've only known each other a few months now, but I can say my perception of um, you has is, is been very favorable, and the experience working together has been a positive one uh, for me, and I uh, have a lot of respect for the stands that you take. Uh, I may not agree with them all the time, but I, I think uh, 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 you're a strong woman and we're served as a, a strong counselor, so thank you. Can I fix good signs? <laughs> Uh, so I, I told Katie this privately, but Katie was one of the biggest reasons why I actually ran for town council. Um, I was in, I was witnessing a very heated town council meeting, and um, I forgot the exact circumstances. But Katie spoke up at a time where it was very difficult to speak up, and um, whether you agreed or disagreed, it was it was it was truthful. And she's always stuck to her principles. And she's been a very tempering and calming influence on the council. So please come back as soon as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Canaria? Um, yeah, I uh, appreciate the time and effort you put in, Katie, and I enjoyed serving with you. And I'm sure I'll see you around in the real estate world. <laughs> And I'd like to thank Katie for uh, her leadership, and uh, she was, you know, always thinking about not only the results but how they're achieved. And uh, I personally benefited from from her advice on on how to act and more appropriately how not to act. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you. But I know that advice will continue. <laughs> so, so thank you, Katie for all that you've done for us. And we won't make you sit through the rest of the evening if you like to <laughs> gracefully exit, whatever you like to do. <laughs> um, and I guess with that, I officially turn it over to Tony for 
We'll do the swearing in of the newly elected officials. We have a member of the sanitary district that I'll swear in first. Yeah. If I could ask you, mm -hmm. gentlemen, to, to move out of the way. Move out of the way. Bruce Summers. Oh, sanitary. Oh, sorry. Move first. Is this so I can leave first? <laughs> Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I am. Please state your name. I am. I Ruth Summers. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and of the state and of the state. So long as I shall. So long as I shall continue a citizen thereof. Continue a citizen thereof. I am. Please state your name. I am Ruth. Summers, do swear, do swear that I will faithfully discharge, that I will faithfully discharge to the best of my abilities, to the best of my abilities, the duties incumbent upon me, the duties incumbent upon me, as a member of the Board of Trustees for the Scarborough Sanitary District, as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Scarborough Sanitary District, according to the Constitution and the laws of the state, according to the Constitution and the laws of the state, and the bylaws of the Sanitary District, and the bylaws of the Sanitary District. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> State your name. I Ken Johnson. Uh, Betsy Glacy. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of the state. And of the state. And of the state. So long as I shall. So long as I shall. Continue a citizen thereof. So long as I shall continue a citizen thereof. I am please state your name. I Ken Johnson. I Betsy Glystein. Do swear. Do you swear. Do swear. That I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully, faithfully discharge, discharge to the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. The duties incumbent upon me. The duties incumbent upon me. The duties incumbent upon me. As a member of the town council. As a, as a member of the, of the town, town council, council. With the town of Scarborough. With the town, the town of Scarborough, Scarborough. According to the constitution and the laws of the state. According to the constitution and the laws of the state. And the charter of the town of Scarborough. And the, and the charter of the town, town of council. Scarborough. Okay. Just need your signatures, if I could, please. <coughs> Six is act on the request for nomination and election of a new town council chair. Do I have any nominations? Yes. I'd like to nominate Councillor Paul Johnson. Um, I, for me, I think of, and I, I just as a little bit of a sidebar, I really want to thank everybody's support for the past year. It's been a great experience. Um, I kind of found taking a full time job in Topsom that it, it is a lot of time and effort, but I think Paul has express an interest, and I look forward to Paul's leadership, and so I nominate Paul Johnson. Is there a second? I second. Any other nominations? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. <laughs> 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 Just because it's there doesn't mean you have to use it. Uh, not well, that's not my custom. Now you're really afraid. Okay, well, it looks like we're on to order number 19087 Act on the request for nominations and elections of new town council vice chair. And is there a motion on the floor? Councilor Don Hamill to be vice chair. Um, I think Paul and Don will make a great team this year. I think they'll 
probably work stuff out by the time it gets, it gets to the council floor, so that's that's all great. So I look forward to their leadership. I second that as uh, the other person of the odd couple. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all those in favor? <laughs> Sorry, any discussion? Any yes. Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> Are there any other nominations? I'm sorry. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Cloutier? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Gleistein? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Johnson? Here again. Sorry. <laughs> 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 We're gonna do that. Hey, bear with me. We'll get through this. Okay. <laughs> uh, item number four: Are there general public comments for anything that is not on the agenda? Anything that's not on the agenda? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, recently, we had two. Well, first of all, congratulations to the new counselors. I look forward to your service and, and thank you to Katie for her service. Uh, it was uh, a great job that she's done. Sir, a can you state steward. your name? And oh, address. sorry. Uh, Liam Summers, uh, Holmes Road, Scarborough. So anyway, welcome. Congratulations. Um, recently, we had two bond issues. Uh, one of them did not pass, which was the replacement field at the high school. Uh, and I just wanted to... Uh, bring your attention to that and ask for uh, any ideas that you may have and i've written the council about this but i wanted to bring it to light in a more public forum uh, i think that there was a, a misunderstanding on the town's part on why we were uh, why the town was seeking funds for that when there was some damage done uh, by a student and and i think people thought well make the kid pay for it to their family and, all. and the reality is that damage that was done and whatever that was is is not consequential to the need to replace the track the track was at the end of life it had to be replaced it's dangerous for our kids uh, it serves the community in a variety of ways outside of just the kids using it seniors use it to walk on the track uh, outside of the field uh, so it serves the community in a host of ways and uh, i just think that there may have been a misunderstanding <coughs> in the community about why the funding was being sought to do that replacement. Uh, a gentleman named Todd Sousa, who heads up, heads up our community uh, service effort, great guy, works really hard, and has worked really hard on this project to source a replacement uh, turf and track, at, uh, and he's negotiated it really well, but that negotiation period expires before we could get this back onto a bond, unfortunately. So it leaves us with a deficit of about $1.2 million to do this replacement that is desperately needed for the school. And my ask, which I have already written to the council, and I believe I've asked a couple of the gentlemen sitting here as well uh, tonight about this, uh, is if there is an alternative way for us to fund this effort for the school to get uh, financing for this track through a corporate sponsorship or other community partnerships, could we look into that? And I know historically what I have heard when I asked that was, that's not something Scarborough has engaged in, but I do know other towns, Cape Elizabeth I believe is one, have done so successfully with corporate sponsorships to partner to get funding for a school need of this magnitude. Uh, and I would love to see us not have to lose the opportunity that, that Todd has worked so hard to present to us um, in, 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 and not take advantage of maybe reaching out to some great community partners that we have in our backyard and see if they would be willing to help us and, and, make this, um, and, and make that replacement a reality. The track needs to be replaced. It is not safe. It's not safe for our kids to play on. It's not safe for people to use. So it's not a, it's not a want. It's not a, hey, would that be great to get a, a nice shiny toy. This is a, this is a desperately needed replacement for our, our schools in our community. So I ask you, if you could, find out where we stand as a town in our ability to ask for a sponsorship uh, corporately in the community. Uh, so that's it. And, and welcome and thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments, general public comments on items that are not on the agenda? 
Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment. Uh, item number five on the agenda, uh, approval of the minutes for the November 6, 2019 regular town council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Yep. Item number six, adjustments to the agenda. No adjustments to the agenda. Item number seven, items to be signed, treasurer warrants. I assume I can do, can I do that after yes. the council meeting? Okay, <laughs> so I'll just do that. Okay, order number 19075, uh, 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough zoning map of the Crossroads Planned uh, Development District. And it says here it's sponsored by the Long Range Planning Committee. I'll let uh, Councilor Katarina tee up or Tom Hall if you'd like. I think this proposal actually came from uh, the developer. But okay. Nonetheless, uh, would you like to introduce it? From your yeah, um, it, this has been before the Long Range Planning Committee. I know when it first came forward, I had a few questions uh, in the committee um, as to you know why they why they needed it, what was going on, um, are they trying to expand into the next lot because they want to do a road at some point. Um, and I did ask those at Long Range Planning. Um, but we did pass it forward to the planning board. Um, and I look forward to Dan's, Mr. Beacon, excuse me, presentation again tonight and any questions that counselors may have. Yep. Go ahead, Mr. Bacon. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Dan Bacon here on behalf of Scarborough Downs, um, and congratulations to the new councilors. We look forward to working with you in the next uh, on this item and items coming before you in the future. Uh, this zoning proposal, as introduced, um, has gone to the Long Range Planning Committee. The council, I think a few meetings ago, conducted a first reading. We've since gone to a public hearing by the planning board, and it's now before you. And it concerns including a 15-acre parcel um, known as the car parcel within the Crossroads Plan Development District. So the Crossroads District, particularly for the, the newer councilors, um, is a zone that's uh, unique to Scarborough Downs. It includes all of the Scarborough Downs land holdings, um, really premised on kind of good planning, master planning, so that development within the project is done in a coordinated fashion. Um, last year, when the Downs acquired a few other adjacent properties, uh, they were in included in the Downs so that they could be designed, again, in a master planned way. Um, so this proposal, again, is to include the car parcel. Uh, this is an abutting piece of land just to the east of um, the Downs and really kind of the center of the Downs um, property. The landowner approached the Downs about kind of selling uh, the land to the project based on it being right next door, based on being it most easily accessible from the Downs versus from other properties. Um, and uh, the intention here is to include it in the district so that development within uh, Scarborough Downs can be planned and developed in a coordinated way um, and to actually buffer the properties that are adjacent to it. So one of the things about um, the Crossroads District is when it abuts residential zones, which it does on that eastern side, as you can see on the plan here, um, there's a required buffer of 100 feet to all residential properties. Um, so this is a parcel that can be developed um, by the Downs, even under the village residential four zone, the current zone. But it would be a bit awkward where there would be a buffer between development within the Downs to then the development that would happen on the village residential four parcel. So our proposal is to, to work with the council and shift the zone line to include the parcel so the buffer can be provided to the neighbors to the project. Um, so that this plan sort of best illustrates um, the different development scenarios with the parcel. So currently the parcel is village residential four. Um, it can be accessed from the Downs. It could be developed under the Village Residential 4. Um, it actually could be sort of 100% developed, and then there wouldn't be a buffer to, to neighboring um, properties. 
So under a zone change uh, with the Crossroads District, there would be that the green that's shown on this plan um, shows the buffer that's provided to, to neighbors and the development that would happen on the parcel would be kind of facing the downs and be integrated into the downs project. So we think that's sort of a better scenario for the downs project, a better scenario for neighbors um, and sort of good planning. Um, and that's why we're coming forward with this, this change. Um, I also say that um, the comprehensive plan that applies to um, the town and the zoning uh, that's in place actually recommended this entire area to be in the crossroads district. So the plan that's furthest on the floor there shows in purple the, the current land use plan and the town's comprehensive plan. And it's probably hard to see from your seats, but there's a little uh, outline of this parcel being within the crossroads uh, mixed use district. So. In a nutshell, that's uh, the reason for the zone change, and we're happy to answer questions if the, the council or the public has any. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, just, just a quick question. You, you made reference that this will be the Scarborough Downs district, but I just want to be clear, we did talk about this at the Finance Committee this evening. This parcel, though, will not be covered by the CEA, CEA is that correct? Right, the CEA, uh, my understanding is the CEA is mapped right. based on tax assessors' maps from um, past November or the past. So this is a zoning map change. It wouldn't change, as I understand it, any CEA boundary. Is that your, so, is that your question? That was my question. So, you, so you're agreeing or you, there's an expectation that this will not be any residential development on this parcel would not be eligible for the CEA? We haven't had that, I don't believe, I think that needs a separate action by the council, but that's uh, probably well, a question for Tom. Tom, you want to speak yeah, to it? I, I can. Uh, the controlling document is actually the TIF district, and that right. is uh, very specifically divined, uh, uh, devised and, and accounted for on existing parcels. This parcel is not included in that, so should it be desired, it would need to be uh, the district amended and this parcel included, so it would require action of council. Action of council, okay, Correct. thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Kluge. So uh, I just want to try to clarify that. So right now there's a 100-foot buffer between the CPD and the village residential sure. yep. um, district. So if you acquire this parcel, that gives you an extra 100 feet by roughly 1,800 feet that would be <clears throat> developable and applicable to the CEA is the way I'm looking at it. Do you, do you agree with that? So I guess, it, yeah, I, I think so. Okay. So the, the parcel that is currently within the TIF district includes the buffer, is what you're saying. Right. So yeah, I would agree with that. The additional land, the 15 acres that would be added to the CPD would not be in the TIF or the CEA district. Okay, and then when you met with the neighbors, uh, did you go over the differences? Like I know that you guys have good intentions and I'm sure it will be a well planned out mm -hmm. development, but you might not own it in five years or 10 years. So with the zoning change, there's pretty drastic differences between what's allowable in VR4 and CPD. Like you could do 20 residential units for, per acre in CPD versus four in the, the VR4, or the um, town village four, and then you can go up six stories um, in the CPD and three stories in the existing zoning. Mm -hmm. And then the allowable uses is drastically different. You can do a lot of, you have a lot of flexibility. So I guess my question is, I don't know if there was town staff at the meeting that you had with the abutters, but was that made clear to them? We talked about, there wasn't town staff. So um, the process that we were asked by the Long Range Planning Committee to do is to have a neighborhood meeting. Since it wasn't a town-sponsored amendment, town staff didn't attend, just to answer that question. Um, we conducted at the grandstand. We invited um, all neighbors that are within 500 feet of the site, which is the requirement of the town, typically, when you do a zone change. And uh, three different residents attended. Um, and we talked about the buffer. We talked about the different zoning the zoning differences between vr4 and cpd um, we didn't like walk through every standard but we um we talked about the differences in the zone okay. thank you yep 
So I, uh, I also attended the Long Range Planning Committee meeting that Jean Marie referenced, yeah. and I remember there was extensive, uh, I mean, it was in my impression, I don't go to every single one of those meetings, but you know, my impression was there was a lot of discussion about what might happen, what might happen, what are the future plans are. And I remember that <clears throat> it was ultimately decided that this was okay in the view of the Long Range Planning Committee to go ahead to the planning board. Mm -hmm. And my impression of, of the process for the planning board, uh, you know, is basically you're, you're asking really specific questions. So your application here, as I understand it, is based upon better buffering and um, a development plan that's more consistent with the uh, Crossroads Planning District. Did I have that right? Do I have that right? Yeah, and in, in developing in a way that's integrated with the Downs versus separated from the Downs. So I'd like to, you know, explore more along the lines. Of the great unasked question is what, what, what is the intention, you know, of, you know, uh, and the plans for development, you know, uh, potentially of that property or, you know, a way to, to establish connectivity, perhaps, on the eastern side of, you know, of the Crossroads Planning District, you know, and I, I recall that was asked uh, maybe in a couple of ways or commented on, and I think the. the the response that I that I could discern was, well, there are no current plans to do that. So, but we're, we're absent any sort of plan at all for the downtown district. I don't think we really, really filed one for that yet. If I have that right, I think you're completed with the residential right. district and also the innovation district. But we don't really have any sort of long-term view of what's going to happen there. So, can you give us? I know this is not within the strict scope of, you know, what we're trying to decide here as zoning change. However, would you? Would you be sure. able to help us understand that, I or can, maybe Jay could help us as well understand the process that would need to be right followed for anyone to do that? And the developers are also here present. Um, so I can touch on some ideas that the team has for this area, but as you know, it's it's fairly kind of deep into the site compared to where plans have already been presented. So it's, I would say it's a bit kind of forecasting, you know, what, what might happen there. Um, but this area of the property, is is basically east and northeast of the track um, if you can think about that and it's south of the innovation district which been, has been approved and the innovation district is the light industrial area that um, i think you're at the groundbreaking and sort of aware of that area so given given that location um, the thinking so far has been that there could be some light kind of commercial that happens south of the innovation district. Um, and then it would transition to kind of more residential as you proceed south. Um, and the thinking there is that we'd likely have kind of light commercial next to light industrial versus residential, right up against light industrial. And then transition towards residential, um, again, to the kind of south and east. So it corresponds well with Sawyer Road and residential probably to the south within the downs. Um, so those are just kind of gener a general sense. As you indicated, it's a mixed use zone, so there's different things that can happen. What can't happen uh, in this area is light industrial. Light industrial is only allowed in the area that's approved already, and there's a line that um, currently kind of limits where that can happen. Um, the other intention is, you know, this 100-foot this buffer is intended to have trails and a greenway system that's really going to kind of wrap around the entire site. Um, so the thinking is that would be incorporated into the buffer. Um, and as you can kind of see on the plan, there's a kind of thumb there that's all green because that's an area that's not really wide enough. You know, it's basically a buffer on a buffer, um, just given the geometry of the site. Does that help? Some? It, does, it still doesn't answer the question, I think. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask Jay, can you give us an idea of what the process would be to make a zoning change here if that were something that were contemplated? I mean, what would be, what would be required to do that if there? Because it doesn't really. I know Dan's question, you know, answers for me sort of what what sort of development is going to be expected. But I, my question was sort of, what's the? Is there a connectivity plan that's part of this, or what? You know, is that? Is this a step along? I the, didn't realize that was your question. Line? Pardon? I didn't realize that was your question about kind of Sorry, it was a long-winded <coughs> question. Sorry. I do that. And so, I, think, I think part of it was at the last council meeting, one of the counselors said there needs to be connectivity to 114. So I think that is getting to part of the question. Is there, a lot, is there any intent to create connectivity to Sawyer Road to 114 through this parcel? 
So currently, Jay Chase, I'm the planning director in town. Nice to meet the new counselors. Um, so let's see. So currently, the CPD district does not permit vehicular connectivity um, to Sawyer Street for anything other than what says in this zone solely residential uses. So could it be possible that there was a, a completely residential neighborhood within the CPD district that connects out to Sawyer, potentially? However, the CPD district really talks about requiring interconnected streets and having sort of all the mass. So through the process, I should step back, maybe one of the questions you also ask is what's the review process? As each sort of <clears throat> area of development comes along within within the cross within the CPD the crossroads plan development district the developers required to get a, a master plan that sort of encompasses at least 50 acres at a chunk could be more um, and so they really start with that sort of overview and that lays out in general terms the uses that are going to be within that area the street network and those sorts of things and as I said um, while the zone does allow for um, the potential for connectivity to only residential areas, there's a n number of other provisions within the CPD that really seek to integrate the, the development with the overall district. So um, I think that would be have to be something that gets reviewed more carefully through the planning board uh, master plan review process. Um, but either way, it, it would be a limited connectivity is all that would potentially be allowed. Um, and again, without having plans before us, so I can't say one way or the other. Rocky might want to say something. I was just going to comment on connectivity from the project standpoint. This zone change isn't proposed to, um, that's not the reason that it's proposed. There's great connectivity, as you know, to Payne Road, to Route 1, and these guys are going to be spending a lot of money on a connection to Haggis Parkway. Um, so for the project, getting access to the project, uh, the team is very comfortable with those access points. This is really more about how this parcel can be integrated with the project from the buffer in um, and provide a bit more upland area in, in that area of the project. So it's, it's, that hasn't been in a, Road connections to benefit the project haven't been um, the focus of this. It's been more about how this parcel can, can work with the rest of the project. Councilor Gleising. Okay, I'm the newbie. Yeah. Go easy. <laughs> um, so is there a reason why we would need to do this now? I mean, it sounds like you're moving forward with the purchase of this land if, if you haven't already done it. Um, it's not in the... Um, you described as development chunks. They have to come forward with 50-acre development chunks. Um, and uh, so is there a reason this needs to be done right now? What's the, um, what's the reason to do it now versus, oh, hey, you know, we bought it, and now we're developing this out. Here's the plan. We need the zone change. So that would be one of my questions. And I, I think you said, um, yeah. you know, the, the zone itself, your uh, crossroads zone requires a 100-foot buffer, and this could be developed out in the current zone without the buffer, right? But someone could choose to do a buffer if they wanted to, right? It's, it's not, you, you know, if somebody developed it out, they could also put a buffer in. It, it, just because it's not required by the zone doesn't mean they couldn't put one in, right? No, they wouldn't be obligated under the zoning. They wouldn't be obligated, but they could. So. And so then the first question about the timing. Right. Um, Rocky will probably follow up my quick answer. I mean, the quick answer is that it's for sale right now. It's under contract and it's dependent on a zone change to probably close on the acquisition of the land. Um, if these guys don't buy it, someone else could and will develop it in the other scenario. Um, so it's, we feel like it's in the growth area. Let's design it in a way that's best for the town and best for the project, which we think is the crossroads scenario versus the VR4 scenario, but would you like to? If I may. Rocky Risperer, Crossroads Holdings. Um, at the risk of getting a little too far in the weeds, we probably wouldn't buy it if we don't get the zone change. Um, we, you know, that's the way our contract is set up. The property can be developed, but it really can only be developed by Mark O'Leary or us. 
The property doesn't have frontage on Sawyer, so there's no way to get to it. It's not, technically it's not landlocked, but there's no way to get to it other than through the Downs or through Mark O'Leary. Mark O'Leary's not very interested in buying it. He's got enough land there. He's got a project he's going to do. Um, so we were pretty interested in it. I thought it made a lot of sense. I uh, think it probably does fold into our project as residential in the future. Uh, that's what we're thinking is going to make the most sense in that area. But just having it, having the property secured now, you know, you can only buy property when somebody wants to sell it. So folks want to sell it. We, we stepped up and said, yeah, we'll buy it, but it's got to be within our crossroads district because it doesn't really make sense to us to try to develop in two different zones and, and you wind up with different types of projects. Could you point to the Mark O'Leary piece that you're referring to, please? So the O'Leary parcel actually has frontage on Sawyer Road, and there's a project, I believe, that's been approved by the planning board uh, of around 100 lots, 90-some-odd lots? 60 or 70 lots. Um, so that's something Mark's been working on for, for quite some time. I think he's got approval, and he's going to move forward with that. Councilor Katarina? Um, I, I suggest we table this uh, until December, or when's our next meeting, the 4th? Um, because I think we, with the new councilors, there's still some questions, and I think it'll, I'm not feeling, I'm feeling like we need to table it until December 4th. So I put that out, no. and there's no discussion. Sure, I think table. before we accept a motion, this is a public okay. hearing and a second reading, so. We do have to have a public hearing on this. Okay, uh, sorry. So, okay, yeah. I withdraw that now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, I just I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I feel like I, we didn't necessarily get a direct answer. So, it sounds like there is connectivity, possibly connectivity through this property to Sawyer Road to to 114. And I guess the question was, when do the residents of on Sawyer Road? know of that possibility or are you are you saying you have no intentions of creating that connectivity because in the past that's really been an issue for the residents on Sawyer Road so if they weren't told and they have no knowledge of that possibility then I think they should be you, we should get some feedback from them on that I think that's a great question and I can hopefully answer it directly so the property right now could be accessed through O'Leary's property and get to Sawyer Road. It'll never get to 114 other than via Sawyer Road. Oh, right. So right. that's that the way that yeah, could get Sawyer developed. Road. Right. If we buy it and we make it crossroads, we automatically cannot connect to Sawyer Road with that property in any way because we can't connect residential into the crossroad zone. So, am I saying that, that right? Seems to con that well, contradicted. Jay, I can clarify that. <laughs> okay. So a strictly residential project within the crossroads zone that doesn't connect to anything else in the, in the downs can connect to Sawyer Road. We're not proposing to do that because we're, we're also required to have interconnected streets. So basically all development within the downs is connected so commercial is connected to residential is connected to light industrial so the nature of the downs project having interconnected streets good street systems basically ban you know prohibits just a residential project from happening within the downs and then a connection to sawyer road that's why we're so confident in, in saying there's a buffer with the crossroads zone to the sawyer road residences there's not the Downs isn't proposing to connect to Sawyer Road. The Downs is proposing to use the portion of the proper property that's adjacent to the rest of the Downs as part of the project and to, to leave Sawyer Road alone with the development design. Does that make more sense? No? It, if I can ask a clarifying question. Sure. The CPD is not defined as residential. And it's a mixed use. Correct. And BR4 so. specifically says you can get to Sawyer Road only if you're in residential. So you do not fit the defini definition right. of residential. And we wouldn't do just the, I mean, the Downs is a mixed use project. Correct. It's not just a residential okay. project. So, so Councilor Harrell? I had a question, and this is, may go to Tom, um, yeah. but what is our authority uh, as a body in terms of uh, deciding on a question like this? I, I know in the realm of 
planning board and some of the other quasi-judicial bodies that it's really rather strict. But what is our, you know, I seem to recall that for contract zone approvals uh, and amendments that our authority, you know, goes along the lines of we could uh, approve it or, or not approve it for any reason or no reason at all. Is that the comparable authority that we have here for reviewing the zoning? Widespread authority. You have the ability to uh, approve uh, land use regulations uh, anywhere in town. This is no different. This is a request from an individual property owner about a particular parcel, but it's no different than your broad authority in establishing land use regulations townwide. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, so before I accept a motion, I'm going to open up to public comment. This is, this is a public hearing, so is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak to this matter? None? Okay, I will close the public hearing. And with that, I um, accept a motion. Councillor Caterina? I move to table till December 4th. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? No discussion. No, no discussion. discussion. Got it. <laughs> All those in favor? Okay, moving on. Order number 19088, act on the requ request to create a health reimbursement arrangement, an HRA, special revenue account pursuant to the provisions of the Scarborough Professional Firefighters Association's Collective Bargaining Agreement. And this is presented by Liam Gall Gallagher, the Director of Human Resources. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Liam Gallagher. <clears throat> Give it a sure. minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing you said. <laughs> not I won't take it personally. It's not you. It's fine. It's, not you. it's, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> boy, you clear a room well. Yeah, boy. <laughs> First the Boy Scouts, now this. Hi, Liam. How are you? Good. It's Boy Scouts leaving now. Good evening, uh, Liam Gallagher, Director of Human Resources. Um, th the uh, order in front of you this evening is uh, a proposal to establish two uh, special revenue accounts uh, for the purposes of um, <coughs> providing essentially reserve accounts for two components of the fire EM under the fire EMS contract um, related to their medical insurance program. Um, in conferring with Councillor Hamill prior to the meeting this evening, uh, I think we both agreed that, that some background was warranted on this issue. Um, so uh, I will, I'll do my best to frame it and then answer any questions the, the Council has regarding these, this proposal and this policy decision. Uh, so uh, the, the insurance program uh, uh, outlined in the fire EMS contract uh, went into effect on January 1st, 2018. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a fundamental shift in the insurance program offered to that union from uh, our sort of typical, very comprehensive medical insurance plans to a higher deductible insurance plan. And with that came the funding of what they call a health reimbursement arrangement. Uh, and there are two separate components to that. Um, you know, in, in practice, the, the concept of this is, uh, or I guess the, the, the theory is that um, when you have a very comprehensive insurance program, uh, there's a, a large portion or at least a, a, a substantial portion of your population that is essentially overinsured. Um, you know, when you have an employee or a participant uh, who uh, has, is, you know, has an annual checkup, no prescriptions, and you're funding an insurance program at you know, $20,000, $25,000 a year, and they're using a few hundred dollars in benefits, the, the idea is that there's an over-insurance happening. Um, and so by moving to a higher deductible plan um, and pairing that with a health reimbursement arrangement, essentially there's a level of self-funding that we're creating uh, to take on some of that exposure at the local level. Um, with the idea that, uh, again, if it all proves out, um, you're going to retain and see some savings in your overall insurance costs. Um, so uh, with the incorporation of this program, we, we incorporated two components. The first one is what we are going to refer to this evening as the HR uh, deductible plan and an HRA credit plan. Uh, the deductible plan is a fully funded HRA to reimburse employees and participants for uh, any and all deductible and coinsurance expenses under the plan. Um, and then the HRA credit plan is essentially 
Um, for those familiar with flexible spending accounts, it acts very much in the same way. It's intended to reimburse any out-of-pocket expenses as far as co-pays, uh, prescription costs, uh, eyeglasses, dental expenses, anything like that that would otherwise be uh, an out-of-pocket expense not covered by the primary insurance. Um, so uh, we entered into this arrangement, again, under the uh, contract that took effect July 1st, 2017. The insurance program went into effect January 1st, 2018. And what we're proposing to do this evening uh, is establish um, special revenue accounts to capture any unspent funds in both of those accounts uh, to be carried forward into uh, or for use essentially in future budget years. Um, and I just want to talk a little, take those two components separately uh, because I think there's a, a, a different level of fiscal prudence or policy uh, related to each one that I want to fully kind of explain um, so the council can kind of consider both of those uh, actions independently. So the HRA deductible plan, uh, we fund annually <coughs> at a level of essentially 40% of the total exposure. Um, so we quantify exposure by uh, totaling up what the total, uh, again, out-of-pocket, deductible and coinsurance expenses would be to the participant because we're essentially have agreed to under the contract reimburse participants for those total <coughs> expenses. So to give you an idea of what that looks like for an employee in a single policy, it's a $4,500 annual exposure. Uh, for an employee enrolled in any dependent coverage, that's a $9,000 exposure per year. Um, so when you, when you factor that out, depending on where the enrollment falls for these 29 employees, that's anywhere from $130,000 to $260,000 a year in potential exposure. Um, so that's how we've essentially budgeted through, uh, the, the plan went into effect essentially halfway through our fiscal year. Um, we run our, our plan years run on a calendar year basis as opposed to fiscal. Um, so through the first year and a half of completed experience, we're trending uh, far, far below about 28, 29% exposure as opposed to the 40% that we budget. Uh, so the action this evening is intended to go back, capture those unspent funds, and bring them forward uh, for future consideration in this special uh, revenue account. Uh, or I'm sorry, special, yeah, special revenue account is what we've, I think my memo uh, incorrectly refers to as a reserve account. Um, so the, the hope here would be that uh, because that exposure from year, year to year can fluctuate so, so much, um, you know, it's tough to uh, budget, and if we had a particularly bad year, we would have a reserve account set up to uh, cover that cost overrun, that budget overrun. Uh, the other hope is that as, um, if we can, again, <coughs> go back and capture those unspent funds from previous fiscal years, we would build up a reserve account where the annual appropriation and ask could either uh, stay consistent or diminish in future years as we have that, that fund to fall back on. Um, so that's sort of the concept be behind the first proposal. Um, the HRA credit plan is a bit different. Um, this represents dollars we have actually committed uh, to participants. These are funds that roll over from year to year, and they are only uh, discontinued uh, by two ways. Either the employee leaves employment, so therefore any available unused funds are forfeited back to the plan and therefore the employer, or they are exhausted. Um, the issue is that um, because they roll over from year to year until that, we don't have a lot of turnover and we haven't brought forward those funds that were unspent from the two fis previous fiscal years. Um, we've essentially, I guess the way that uh, Don and I sort of discussed it, um, was we sort of written checks and they haven't come due yet. They haven't been cashed yet. And so right now we're, we, we're a bit exposed, um, absent bringing these front, I mean, um, you know, I think the, the figures are in there in terms of what that exposure is. On a full year basis, you know, we commit $1,000 or we have historically per the contract committed $1,000 per participant. So that's about a $29,000 annual expenditure um, that we funded. But it's essentially, it's, it's a liability that we're not, I don't think we're appropriately accounting for at this point. Um, you know, if we had re remitted those funds to our third party provider and they had held those funds from year to year, so we essentially wrote a check every year for you know, $20,000. Our third party provider held that and then just simply reimbursed as those expenses came in. But that's not the way uh, our provider works. We hold those funds until they're actually sent out the door to the participant. So if whatever's not rolled over from year to year is being um, such a return to the general fund and we have some outstanding sort of liabilities we're looking to, to uh, appropriately, appropriately reconcile at this point. 
So that was my attempt at an explanation. And <laughs> I'm the, key, the key points for me, yeah. uh, and Liam, thanks very much for doing all the work on this. Uh, you know, we spent some time going into a fair amount of detail. I mean, basically, this is, uh, it's not a requirement. It's, not, uh, it's something we have to do. It's, it's uh, uh, opportunistic for us, but it purely it would be a, a funding policy change to create a reserve account so that surpluses could be rolled forward and we wouldn't, wouldn't have to guess on funding year to year. If we don't do this, the, if those surpluses are not used now, they would just go back into an unrestricted fund and they would have to go through the process of approval all over again. So it's simpler, it's straightforward, it's completely kosher, and I, I think it uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think that's absolutely correct. I think the only thing is, is with that credit plan, because, um, because those are real committed dollars, because those, those are checks and commitments we've made, um, there is a, a greater exposure potential, I think, with that component than with the HRA deductible plan reserve account proposal. Councilor Harrell, if you could just wait to be recognized next time. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, <laughs> Councilor, Councilor Gleistein. That was a joke, Councilor. So on the um, deductible fund, um, mm -hmm. it sounded like that could be used. So, I mean. It probably won't happen, but it goes up, it goes up, and that could be used where we look at it and say, well, there's 50000 in it. We could potentially fund the budget at a little lower level, right? So have you, um, have you looked at what a cap might be that would make sense to say to the town councilors, if you get at least... Fifty thousand in this, then I recommend that you, um, you know, fund use that a certain percentage of that to go back, you know, to offset the budget. Yeah, Councillor, that's that's exactly right. Um, I think that that would be subject to an annual appropriation through the budget committee or the finance committee. They would be looking at where does our reserve account stand and what is the what is essentially the annual budget ask in that line item. And I think that would be an annual opportunity to look at that and adjust accordingly. You know, if they said that reserve account. So was, you could make a recommendation to us then. Sure. Based I, on yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yep. Councillor Hayes. Yeah, just a quick question more on the HSA credit fund. Have have we got a legal opinion about the fiduciary responsibility or you know what's happening more and more is once benefits have been set aside for a certain benefit class, mm -hmm. those monies only can be used for to benefit that same class of mm -hmm. well, to take it to the nth extreme if you set aside a thousand bucks for Mary. Mm -hmm and Mary doesn't use it, mm -hmm. is there any liability that Mary, those dollars need to come back to Mary? Could lay claim to it, essentially? Yeah, you lay claim, yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, the HRA is fundamentally different than an HSA. Right, you know, HSA is, is, in, uh, is in the participant's name. Uh, that's a, that's a, a vehicle that people can take from employer to employer. And right. HRA are dollars that re reside with the employer. Mm -hmm. um, so if they leave, they have no future claim yeah, to the... Didn't you say it was an SA? HSA credit? HRA credit. HRA. They're both oh, HRAs. Uh, they're just, oh, we've, we've labeled them differently because they've had different purposes. <coughs> yeah. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Councilor Kluge. So I think I'm following most of this, and I'm going to try to repeat it. Sure. Uh, the way it works today is we budget 40% of the exposure, and we typically spend about 30% of the exposure. So there's a, a premium that we're budgeting to make sure that we have enough in the fund Correct. to cover it. At the end of the year, that rolls into the general fund. Correct. Okay. So if we do this reserved fund, you could probably start budgeting it at a max of 30%, but you wouldn't, you would have enough cushion in the fund to cover that. So the, um, so there's a budget impact or. Exactly. You don't yeah. have to plan for as much risk because you have yeah. some savings. To Councillor Gleistein's point, exactly right. Um, I think that we would, we would build up the, the idea. I think the, the recommendation to your point would be uh, to build up that fund to a certain degree that we're comfortable with, and then we could start reducing that annual appropriation until that fund is su you know, sufficiently depleted uh, below whatever we think that target value should be. Now, the part I'm not quite clear on is yeah. you mentioned that this would help us clear up some liabilities. Yeah. Can you explain that a little? So, so again, the HRA credit portion is where I'm sort of using that language, um, and that's because the 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 uh, initial year we committed $500 to every person in the plan, 
Um, so that $500, if it wasn't used, because HRAs roll over from year to year, unlike an FSA where it's a sort of use it or lose it benefit, mm -hmm. um, if they haven't used that $500 and uh, at the end of the fiscal year, that's forfeit, essentially goes back to the general fund because it's the line item has not been spent. Um, but that $500 is still a commitment to that participant to be used at a future date as they incur additional medical expenses. And so that portion, because we've been under budget, and again, I think I provide some figures, uh, you know, for instance, the first year we budgeted $13,500. Again, this was a partial year. Uh, we expended $7,858. So that $5,642 right now is still out there available for those participants to utilize, but we did not carry those funds forward to represent that liability. I understand that. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Yep. Thank you. Just a final point. <coughs> you comfort, uh, the use of these funds is entirely controlled by council, so it's not automatic on our part. Uh, it would really come in two ways as I see them. Either through the annual budget process, we bring these in as revenues or reduce the budget request. Or if we find ourselves uh, in a situation where we have a particularly bad year, unexpectedly bad, uh, we may come to you mid-year and say, we'd like you to authorize X number of dollars from the reserve account to cover this overage. But in all cases, you control the use of those funds. And one last point, you know, no action or inaction this evening by the council fundamentally changes the obligation under the contract. Um, so um, that, that's there no matter what. It's just a question of policy question of how we want to uh, handle the, the future planning for that. All right, do I have a motion? Public comment? Do we oh, sorry, public comment. Anybody? No public comment? Motion to approve. Second. And discussion? None? All right. All <laughs> in favor? Comment, if I may, Mr. <laughs> yes, Chairman. Absolutely. It's really more than anyone ever wanted to know <laughs> <laughs> about it. HR. I, I came prepared with a whole bunch of statistics in the event there would be uh, additional he's, questions he's about the. He's excited about this. Uh, you know, uh, this is boy. his world. Huh? Oh, boy, oh, boy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I ask one quick question? A absolutely. So, how, yeah. how did you. So, it seems like a great idea to me. It starts to take a little bit of risk out of the, the budget. Yeah. So, is this something that a lot of towns are doing? That? So, how did you come on this? Because it seems like a really. Really good idea. Yeah, so I can't take credit for it. Um, this was a, a provision that was agreed to um, uh, negotiated by my predecessor. Um, I, I will say that there are a number of communities uh, that are, are moving towards uh, some level of self-insurance through the HRA component. Um, I don't think to the degree and investment that Scarborough did when they jumped in. Um, uh, but, you know, we, we did bring forward this proposal to our other collective bargaining groups in, in the, the next year when those contracts were up. Um, we came to a different agreement with those, those two other unions and then subsequently in, incorporated that um, that same provision to the non-union group. Um, so I am seeing, a, a, we have seen a trend, uh, sort of generally looking at the municipal sectors. Um, and I think that so far the experience with this group has been really encouraging. Um, you know, again, forecasting, I, I, and these are some of the figures that I came prepared to speak to, so I might as well take the opportunity. Um, you know, we envision saving about $50,000 uh, just with this one group on an annual basis. Um, I think the savings were, were in excess of that. That was based on a 40% utilization, so you can sort of uh, reduce or, or sort of work backwards and find those other figures for additional savings. So it was a, a worthwhile provision, and we've really continued to provide a very, very generous, comprehensive benefits package uh, for the fire group. So this has been a success story. I can't speak to what other people's experiences have been, um, but it, it's worked well here. Just if I could add a point to that, I, I think we do owe a debt of gratitude to the fire union that they are receptive to this. Mm -hmm. Just imagine the proposition that we brought to them, which is to remove what has been so near and dear to them, which is mm -hmm. the you know, point of service, very traditional, uh, very good health care coverage with something different and new. And mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate that they were receptive to the idea and worked with us through it. And that was the crack in the door. We were able to move it into the other groups, and including my union. So I'm very pleased to have moved it through in a, in a fairly short time frame. Over four years, we've been able to expose it across the employee base. All right, great. With that, all in favor? Great. That's unanimous. Thank you, Liam. Thanks, Liam. <coughs>
Okay, order number 19, excuse me, 19089, act on the request to amend the town of Scarborough financial and fiscal policy. And I will let uh, Councilor Ham Hamill tee this one up for us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is the result of uh, a lot of work by the town staff, uh, in particular Larissa Crockett, uh, uh, on helping us to define um, a dashboard and some financial metrics. Um, the work's not done yet. Um, it's likely going to continue uh, going forward with. Uh, the, you know, the finance committee and the council uh, next. Um, basically what you have here in front of you, and apologies for the short turnaround on this, but we felt that uh, we had uh, discussed uh, the dashboard and financial metrics at length. So basically the, uh, uh, the proposal is to amend our financial and fiscal policy policies by confirming the use uh, of the uh, of four metrics, annual debt service, and these metrics are already in the financial policies. Basically what this order is doing is, is ensuring that the ratios will be reported annually as part of the fiscal health metrics dashboard, which was approved by the Finance Committee. So we're basically ad ad adopting them and committing to use them annually, um, those first four metrics. Uh, debt service as a percentage of revenues, uh, debt as a percentage of of state value, state equalized value, debt per capita, and per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income. Those, those are in the financial policies today and in this statement. Thanks, Tom, for, for uh, you know, making a complicated thing very simple in one sentence. So that's, that's essentially what we're, what we're recommending. Dear report, this is intentionally vague. It doesn't attach the dashboard. The dashboard that you saw the last meeting actually has four other uh, report areas and it may be that the finance committee wants to look and, and further expand the policy to include those but this is intentionally vague really to codify the fact that we're going to do this uh, we're going to use this kind of dashboard approach but it adds flexibility to the report for the metrics that the finance committee at the time thinks are important uh, but i think it's a good first start public comment first public comment correct <laughs> right anybody on the public would like to speak to this Okay, do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. And discussion. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I was, just, <laughs> I was just gonna elaborate. I mean, actually, this doesn't change anything. All this was was an attempt that we had heard from our constituents that they really wanted to have an easy to read, easy to understand, just sort of quick dashboard of how we're doing financially. So this really was meant just to respond to that. Actually, the finance committees over the last probably four years have had looked at, we probably looked at a couple versions of this each year, Tom. So, so finally we vectored to something we sort of agreed on. And so all we're trying to do is codify this and attach it. It's a work in progress. What we want to do is be able to get it out into the public. We'll take feedback for it, but it'll, it's a living, breathing document. But all it does, it's just meant to inform our public about where we are financially. <clears throat> Councilor Pucci? So I, I like the dashboard and metrics in general. Then uh, <laughs> I, I think using them is great. This one has been educational for me, though, in that uh, when I was trying to understand if we could put this on the agenda, I, I, I looked on the website and there's uh, a, a link for the town ordinances. So I went there and I saw that the fiscal and financial policy was listed as chapter 101 and, uh, and then all of our ordinances are, are listed there. So for anybody new, I guess what I'm, why I'm saying this is that not everything listed there is an ordinance. There, right. Some of them are actually policies and procedures, which um, uh, was very clarifying to me. So policies we are able to act upon without a public hearing and a lot of notices. Ordinances we are not. So mm -hmm. as a policy and uh, given that it relates to metrics, I fully support moving this forward. Any others? All right, with that, all in favor? It's unanimous. I speak a lot less as the chair. It's a little disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you? Got to tell you about that. No. <laughs> 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 yeah, try, try telling you that. Yeah, haven't had an opinion all night. I what? <laughs> so yeah, we'll get out quickly. <laughs> Can we modify the time? <laughs> Okay, item number eight is a non-action item. It is a presentation on the proposed timeline and process regarding the town's manager's performance evaluation and employment agreement. And it, uh, it says here, Liam Gallagher, Director of Human Resources. Before we do that, I'm actually going to toss it over to Councillor um, Hamill one time so he can 
give the council side and we'll let Liam take it away. So Thanks very much. Offer my apologies, Councilor Hamill. Yes. I was trying to keep, tee this up and I didn't realize the screen was going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies for that. So it's on three screens for you to enjoy. <laughs> uh, this, I just want to tee this up by saying uh, uh, that this represents a lot of work that has made its way through committee. Um, the appointments committee, uh, Peter, um, Jean Marie, and uh, you know we've adopted uh, Liam as a you know as an adjunct member here. So so he's driving most of the work, and it's his accountability to to really run the traps on all of this. Uh, we th we thought it was a good time to to talk about the process that we have going forward. Uh, this is a process that will involve public and private components. Um, and there are also two pieces of it, a performance evaluation and, a, and an employment agreement renewal. So we thought it would be helpful to run through what the timeline and process is, and we'll be updating as we go and as appropriate, but um, we thought it'd be very helpful for the council and also for the public uh, to, to understand this. And with that, uh, over to Liam. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Liam Gallagher, <coughs> HR Director. So um, to echo some of um, Councillor Hamill's points, you know, we've, we've had uh, this on sort of our, our radar. Uh, again, the committee's had it on their radar for a number of months. And, uh, you know, the way, I, the best way I think I sort of interpret uh, this is just, you know, making sure the council is aware of what their uh, obligations are as far as their manager goes. Um, and everyone's aware of what these timelines are going to be. Um, you know, we have a, an annual evaluation process, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but I think it's just about uh, getting in front of everyone so they know because we're going to start ramping up with our uh, annual evaluation process, not only of the manager, but internally this is sort of our evaluation time of the year. Um, so it, it sort of follows that. Um, so again, we're going to go through uh, just briefly, we'll touch on the, the process and timeline for the performance evaluation. Uh, we want to uh, make people aware of the, the deadlines and, and um, steps in the, the renewal process for the town manager's agreement. Uh, and then we also want to certainly highlight the fact that tonight's not about uh, talking about, uh, you know, performance or you know, you're talking about the evaluation, it's simply to talk about the process and the timeline and uh, provide it out to the council for any feedback you have or questions you have on, on sort of the proposed process the committee's come up with um, through uh, next spring. So uh, the performance review process and timeline, just to give a little bit of background, this is really the process that the council has followed. Uh, and, and again, perhaps there are some uh, historians on the council that can uh, give me a better idea, but as far as I can uh, ascertain, goes back at least as long as uh, town manager Hall's uh, time here has been, so going on 10 years. Um, in December, I will be distributing uh, individual evaluation forms to each sitting councillor prior to the November election. So the two uh, councillors who have just cycled off uh, will be completing evaluation forms. All of those forms come back to me. Um, I distill all that data uh, anonymously, so we're not saying, uh, you know, Councillor Hayes or Councillor Hamill or, or Councillor Johnson, here's the rating. We just, we, we keep it uh, anonymous from that standpoint. We incorporate all of the comments received on those evaluations. So essentially what happens is, um, and again, this is uh, in January of 20, the evaluations are then uh, distributed to the council and the manager to uh, kind of go through that data and that feedback. Um, a new step that we did last year, uh, I think it was, uh, again, I think it was the, the council in general's uh, suggestion that uh, the town manager also complete a self-evaluation for some additional feedback on what's working well what, and where there's some opportunities. Um, I think that was positively received and, and also gave us another sort of, uh, or gave the council rather a metric for, um, you know, what, the, what those opinions and positions are. Um, so in January of 20, uh, those evaluations would be uh, distributed. And also the, the current council, uh, an immediate past counselor, so the counselors who completed evaluation forms will come back in, uh, essentially there, there will be the opportunity for nine uh, people to weigh in on uh, the performance of the manager, uh, talk about goals, talk about objectives, um, and any other comments uh, after receiving the consolidated evaluation. And then in February of 20, uh, the, and again, this, this is sort of offered up as, a, as an option, and it will be uh, Chair Johnson's 
uh, with perhaps some feedback or input from the Appointments Negotiations Committee as to how to handle this in the subsequent year. Uh, but in previous years, it's either been the council chair and vice chair or the council chair and the immediate past chair um, have, have met with the manager in a more informal setting, uh, talked about those, those reviews, feedback, comments, and uh, discussed general goals. So that's sort of been the process we've uh, followed. Um, so we'll, we'll kick off uh, very early next month with sharing those forms and we'll, we'll go from there. In my two years here, I think I've been a bit behind the eight ball. So that's again another reason why I wanted to make sure we got out in front in November um, to make sure people are aware of that process. Don, do you have, Councillor Hamill, do you have anything you'd like to add to, to the, okay. No. Any questions from the, the council? Councillor Kluge. Uh, yeah, does senior staff play any role in the, the review process? Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, uh, no, there's no, there's no formal, currently, or at least historically, to my knowledge anyway, uh, there's been no, uh, essentially a 360 evaluation, I think is what mm -hmm. you're referring to. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any 360 evaluation that's been completed. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, only a, a comment or observation, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think, <clears throat> Liam, you know, represent that last year we kind of did have the town manager sort of review himself. And actually, it was, it was an interesting process. You know, at some point, you may want to talk to Tom, but actually, I found he actually, most of the comments that we had, he reflected, and the self-reflection actually was mm -hmm. spot on. So it, it was a great sort of confirmation that the, the, the messaging and Tom's observations were very similar, so. Any other? OK. Oh, yes. I, guess, I just wanted to say, oh, yeah, as the historian, I guess I'm the historian. You, you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, yes, this matches uh, what we've done in the past, and I think it's good to see it laid out. And as I pointed out when we were working on this, that you know, for the public, this isn't just regarding Manager Hall. This is how we want to do with anyone who's sitting a, as a town manager. So. You know, this isn't just specific to Manager Hall. Sure. This is the process it's going forward. Councilor Gleistein. Uh, the, are there goals from last year that exit, that were set by the last year's council? Um, we will go over what, uh, when we have the uh, sort of the group conversation um, to the agreed goals were, were set and objectives were discussed, though that's when we would uh, discuss it. I think the short answer is I know that there was a conversation that have happened where that stands, I'd defer to the council and the, the chair. Are those goals typically made public? When, no. So these are, your, so, the, you know, I mean, these are so, I mean, you know, at a company, I mean, you know, everybody knows what your goals are. I guess, you know, your boss and your boss's boss and your boss's boss, but. So do our goals typically made public or they're, they're between the council and the town manager? Between the council and the town manager, yeah. It sort of really follows a, a traditional, um, you know, it's part of the performance evaluation, which are confidential under statute. Okay. And so that's the reason for that. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other final questions before I move on? So um, the, the town manager employment agreement renewal. So um, again, this is a process that, that the council undertakes um, every three, year, three years or so. Um, and there are uh, both steps in this process that I'm going to outline that are uh, included in the, the town manager's employment agreement. There are others that are some suggestions for, for steps in the process that the committee has, um, is recommending or proposing. Um, so uh, the first one is, is a, a recommendation or a proposal, I guess, for discussion. Uh, and that would be kicking off in March of 2020, uh, council meet with um, human resources to determine essentially what, what data they would find helpful as they begin that process uh, to, to consider uh, a negotiation with the town manager. And so we've already, through this committee, done some work on market data, comparable, uh, comparable data, um, looking at other communities, looking at their manager's compensation. Uh, I think it's, there's been some level of detail, and again, we'll get into some of the specifics around that data. Um, but essentially, this would be kind of a kickoff meeting for this council to weigh in on is do we think those are appropriate comparables? Is there information or data they would like to see to, to best aid them through that process? So that's sort of a, a, a kickoff to the process. Um, March 31st, 2020, or before, uh, the manager is obligated per his employment agreement to notify the council of the expiration date of his employment agreement. Again, that is, that is specific language in the employment agreement. And I, my understanding, and, and certainly Mr. Hall can fill in any blanks, 
uh, that is something I think as brief as that. Um, just making you aware that this is the timeline for my employment agreement. Um, May 2020, we're proposing that council meets an executive session uh, to consider an employment agreement, agreement extension. Uh, review that data that we discussed in March. Um, you know, fill in any blanks, answer any questions, just so they're prepared for, for what they think is relevant before they enter into those, those conversations. June 1st, 2020 uh, is, the, again, the deadline for, for council to meet regarding the town manager employment agreement. Um, and again, that's, that's what language contained in the agreement. Um, I'm not sure uh, if, uh, uh, you know, outside of meeting, uh, which we would establish that we had, the council had met, um, I think that that likely fulfills that obligation. And again, June 2020, uh, the proposed step would be the council meeting executive session to discuss specific extension terms and conditions. So, you know, obviously a, a contract negotiation is a two-way street. It's between two parties. This is simply to get the council, proposed to get the council organized for what objectives, terms, et cetera, they would like to approach the manager with. And how that happens, again, I think there have been some discussions as a committee as to whether that will be a process um, delegated to the Appointments Negotiations Committee. I believe that that was part of the vision for changing the, the scope of that committee from just the Appointments Committee to the Appointments Negotiations Committee. Um, so sort of as a liaison to the full council. June 30th, 2020, the council notified manager of decision to renew or not to renew an employment agreement. So that is again a, a specific date. And that one does have a, a tangible consequence, which is absent notification, the employment agreement automatically renews for a three year term. Um, so that is a, that's a, a deadline, um, <clears throat> and a, uh, that's a deadline for the, the council to um, be cognizant of. Again, we're proposing that uh, July 2020, um, the council or ANC on the council's behalf, meet with the town manager in executive session to uh, begin negotiating a successor agreement. And the last date there is December 1st, 2020, which is when the current employment agreement is due to expire. Any questions? Councilor Clucci. Uh, Lehman, your experience mm -hmm. with other towns, yeah. uh, have they ever brought in an outside negotiator to, uh, to kind of firm the details of the contract and then have that approved by uh, I, I, and again, I'm, I'm really drawing from fairly limited experience there. Um, I certainly am aware that when an initial offer is made with a manager, um, that oftentimes is facilitated by you know, the uh, recruitment agency or head, you know, whoever brings that person to you. Ongoing, um, ongoing contracts, I've never seen a, a sort of a, a liaison. I, again, I, I don't know if um, town manager Hall has, has ever seen or heard that from any of his colleagues. I'm not aware of that. No, I think you're right. In the first instance, the initial contract is usually something that the outside assistance may be required. Mm -hmm. Presuming that the agreement is fairly well established in the first instance, uh, we're talking about you know, some fairly modest changes within a, a federal bill structure. Thank you. Yep. Any others? Question process, great. Right. So just, uh, so moving ahead, so what, uh, again, this is sort of the data, just to give a, a, a preliminary overview. Uh, this is sort of the data we've been working with now for a period of time. Uh, we'd propose to provide some market data, comparable communities. Right now we're, we're capturing about 18 southern and central Maine communities. <coughs> um, so obviously that list will be provided. You can decide as a, as a body whether we think those are relevant or not. Um, obviously largely they're southern Maine communities, coastal communities, or of a certain population size is generally how we've looked at that. Um, and uh, again, it will give you a basis for looking at what the uh, compensation is currently in the employment agreement and how that stacks up to compet uh, competitors, neighbors, comparables. So um, concludes those four components, um, which are, are unique to the town manager's employment agreement. So I'll give you an idea of where that stacks up and, and how the council uh, wants to receive that information and move forward. Um, you know, I think the point I've made consistently through our, our conversations and is, you know, this is a, a fairly simple equation. You have a council, you have a manager. If you like each other, then you figure out what's going to work for both parties. Um, you know, so I think, I think it's obviously good to have some uh, comparable data and look at how some other communities have structured that and what their commitment and investment is for their managers and how they stack up. Um, but that's really, at the end of the day, the, the simple equation, what's going to work for, for all parties. Any final questions? Just a comment, I'd like to thank Liam for his work on this. It's been very diligent, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll see this at some point, but uh, he's done a lot of work on the market data analysis, so he'll just be 
freshening that data, but he put uh, untold hours into that. It's very, uh, be very interesting when you have a chance to see it. So thanks, Liam. Yep. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, no, thank Liam, you. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Okay, we're on to item number nine, which is standing and special committee report reports and liaison reports. And I will start with Councilor Clucci at the end. Sure. So the uh, community center committee continues to meet weekly. Uh, uh, the survey was completed. We had over 1,800 respondents. We've covered that. That work was used to come up with a uh, essentially a request for or needs analysis for the community center. And that was sent to the developer on November 8th so that they can come up with pricing and come back to us with pricing. Um, we had hoped to receive that pricing on Monday, but they have requested an extension uh, until December 9th is when we currently have it scheduled for them to come to council chambers here so that the uh, presentation and meeting can be recorded. Um, so it, it kind of gave us a little bit of a breath uh, or a chance to take our breath. Uh, the finance subcommittee is actively trying to get their arms around the scope of their work and, and what they're going to do when they get that pricing back. Um, so there will continue to be weekly, weekly meetings, um, but they will be coming back to the council with a request for extension um, to accommodate uh, the delayed uh, response with providing pricing. So um, I expect that uh, Paul or I will bring that to the council next week um, when we have the final date from the committee. So okay. thank you. Thanks. Councillor Hayes? Councillor Gleistein? <laughs> nope. <yet>. Nothing. <laughs> Councillor Katarina? Um, there is no ordinance meeting tomorrow. I noticed it was in the leader or the forecast or something under lists of meetings, but there is no ordinance meeting tomorrow. That's it. Councillor Johnson? I have nothing for you to this good. evening. Good. <laughs> Well, at least we know your microphone's working now. That's good. <laughs> Councillor Hamill? <laughs> uh, two updates. So one, uh, I would like to uh, do a first reading for um, an Appointments and Negotiations Committee, uh, an appointment uh, to full voting member for the Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee for Vincent Clow uh, for a term expiring 2021. Uh, he was the first alternate. And backfilling uh, Vincent Clow will be Jeff Caldwell for a term expiring 2020 as first alternate on the Coastal Harbors. So I always get that wrong. Coastal Waters and Harbor <laughs> Committee. Great. I think I'll just take my time real quick to piggyback on what Councillor Clucci said. Uh, first, uh, Councillor Gleistein, thank you because um, I think it was because of your question and your comments that we think it's very appropriate that the December 9th presentation to um, to the committee from the developers will be here and it will be broadcast live on. Um, Scarborough Television, mm -hmm. and which is great. So thank you for those comments. Awesome. Yep, yeah, great. And uh, secondly, I said this at the committee, but just to reiterate, I would I just ask staff that if we can get the finance subcommittee's meetings on the website, um, I think that would be important. Yes. Um, I know that they're a smaller committee and they often meet in small rooms, but I, those that are, are very interested in this process are probably mm -hmm. interested in the finance subcommittee. Yes, so, in fact, yep. uh, th there's one tomorrow at 1230, I believe that is on the calendar and there's an agenda on the credenza outside. So to the extent we're aware of it, we'll publicize it. I did have one finance committee uh, or a couple of finance committee updates. Uh, first of all, we reviewed the TIF uh, and oh, CBA sure. yeah. policy uh, in what was a uh, good natured and spirited discussion. You know, <laughs> we, uh, and we actually ended the, 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 uh, the meeting on time. Um, so that'll be coming coming forward, I think, uh, after this for the council to review, and I think that's very timely considering what's at issue uh, with the Downs Edge and whatever else may be coming. Um, finally, uh, <clears throat> there we spent a lot of time in joint committee uh, with the uh, with our partners on the Board of Ed uh, Joint Finance Committee, and uh, it went over the summer, and uh, you know it was sometimes fun and not sometimes not fun. But the good news is that there is a a joint recommendation that's coming forward. It's advisory in nature because it comes out of workshop land, you know, sort of non-action land. However, uh, we believe it will be something that uh, the council will find of interest and will have an opportunity to to review that and approve that uh, on December 4th. And I think that uh, uh, that's going forward uh, uh, as well in parallel in the board of that. So, so uh, it's a bit of an experiment. So, uh, you know, uh, 
but we, we felt there was a need for us to make some process improvements, so uh, we look forward to getting the feedback of the new council on that. Yeah, and sorry, I, I probably started early on the, there. I apologize. But, and, you know, Council Hamill, I told you last meeting, is I admire your ability and your willingness to, it's important we do, the, meet, do these meetings consistently, and you're the one that's usually <laughs> leading that charge, and I know you get an earful from time to time, but Two earfuls. Please, please know that I... <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> it's, thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, the town manager report. Yes, two, two or three quick items here. Uh, public safety building, uh, weather's not exactly cooperating, but uh, we're persevering. Uh, you may have noticed on the, on the face of the building facing Route 1, uh, the masons are continuing hard at work. They've actually enclosed that area and have that area partially heated so they can continue their work. Uh, inside, work is going tremendously well. Uh, I think Councilor Kluchy was in the building today. I want to extend an opportunity for anyone who's interested. We're pleased to take uh, take you through a tour if you're interested. But uh, there's paint up in nearly all the uh, uh, all the interior walls, and so things are pro progressing really nicely. We continue to work with our design team and contractor uh, regarding there were some design issues that they've worked through that they uh, they're they're now kind of sorting out the responsibility for payment, and uh, there's a process that we're undertaking. Um, the good news is we are very comfortable the town is not responsible for any of that, but we're the beneficiary of delays, if you will, and so we're trying to do our part to keep this team working as a team. Um, I, I did a promise to the Finance Committee, and so I'll, I'll be working with the, the new committee chair, if there is a new one. Um, I do want to identify the funding to, uh, to just for all of our benefits. Uh, for the new councillors, this project started uh, with about $420,000 uh, kind of over budget, if you will. And it was, a, I think, a full, rich discussion around that, recognition of it, and strong encouragement from the Council at the time to proceed and sign the contracts, which we did. Through the course of the last year of the construction, uh, that's risen by another 100000 or so. So I, I want to make it as clear as I can. I hear some confusion in the community that the project is terribly over budget and that you know, there's been unexpected uh, occurrences that's simply not the case. Um, Frankly, to have a project of that size uh, be just $100,000 uh, 12 months into the project and probably 75% through uh, is a, a fairly remarkable feat in my view. So uh, I'll be prepared uh, sometime next month to bring a recommendation uh, as to how to finalize the, the funding components. Um, regarding the turf, uh, Mr. Summers uh, spoke of it this <coughs> evening, and I think it's been a bit misunderstood and not reported correctly in the paper. Um, we're not certain that the, that the surface is unsafe to play on. If we did believe it was unsafe, we wouldn't allow it to be played on. I will say uh, it, it has lived its useful life, and uh, we have ordered a, an evaluation of sorts to uh, really determine its playability and, and safety. Uh, that work, I think, is going to be accomplished this week, so we'll have the answer fairly quickly. Um, our hunch is that uh, the majority of it will, will be fine. It's just certainly not ideal and it's not a problem that's going to take care of itself. So I think his points uh, are extremely well taken, but I want to uh, make sure that everyone appreciates we're not going to put our, our youth and our, our residents in harm's way. If it's unsafe, we will take the appropriate action. Um, so much so, I know uh, the athletic director has made alternative arrangements to relocate spring sports should that be needed. He's just trying to get those plans in place. Um, that's something that we could tolerate without, with some inconvenience, I would note. Uh, should we run into problems uh, in the fall, that presents a whole other issue, uh, particularly with, with football. Mm. Uh, there really is not an option in southern Maine for us to relocate football operations to. So there's an issue there that, that this council and uh, your colleagues on the Board of Education, I think we're going to have to talk about um, and come up with a strategy in the coming weeks and months uh, as to how we're going to move that project forward because it's not going to take care of itself. Lastly, I want to congratulate the uh, election of new leadership tonight. I look forward to working with you both. I want to encourage you, uh, and I assume you'll be looking at filling committee assignments uh, as quickly as you can, and that would be terrific because I think there's some work that we need to continue with. And I want to encourage you to do either team building or goal setting, somehow bring this group together uh, to start to get to know each other, To find out how you're going to work and function as a group, uh, and I'm pleased to help you plan those events. Mr. Chair, I have a request for information. Can I ask my question? Yep, go ahead. Yep, sorry. Um, so uh, my 
question is for uh, um, Tom. Mm -hmm. So tonight, Liam asked about corporate sponsorship, and a number of people have asked about that. Um, and so how would we move that forward? Um, so it's my understanding a couple people have asked both the past superintendent, the AD, um, and I understand really maybe it's a, it is a town field. It doesn't necessarily belong to the school. This, if there is a policy for no mm -hmm. sponsorship or something in the charter, is this something that you could clarify for us? Sure. And if, if there isn't anything, could you give us some information about how we would have a town with a board looking for a sponsor? Yeah, I, I can answer the first part of that fairly simply and directly. Uh, there is no town policy prohibiting spo uh, seeking sponsorship. Um, we, we have not pursued that, to my knowledge, uh, in any kind of meaningful way, but I'm not aware of any anything that would bar that activity. Um, on the school side, I do believe they do have uh, one or more policies that speak to sponsorship, and I think we'd be wise to understand what those parameters are in respect of as best we can, but I'm not aware that they had an outright bar to that approach. I guess what I would say is I would like, if we pursue this, is that we have a very well thought out and coordinated strategy. Um, mm -hmm. A request of the order of magnitude that I'm thinking here um, should not be taken lightly, and I think we need to show the, the due respect uh, to the potential donors and present a, a very clear and convincing argument. So um, I applaud any resident who is standing at the podium and expressing a willingness to help, but I, I would hope that's a path worth pursuing. We ought to take it on as a formal action. Uh, kind of a joint action school in town. Thank you. Good. All right. So, uh, Councilor uh, item number 11 is council member comments, and I'll start with Councilor Hamill this time. Um, welcome to the new members. I'm looking forward very much to working <coughs> with you. And I think we have a lot ahead of us, but it's going to be an interesting and I think um, potentially very rewarding year for us. So looking forward to it. And special thanks to Tom and staff. I mean, this has been a very busy time for him and the, and the team. And, uh, you know, because of all these meetings that we have, there's all kinds of prep that uh, is required and they, uh, you know, never miss a beat. So I really appreciate that. And in particular, the uh, ability to rely on Liam, you know, a gallery as a resource. He's a direct report of yours. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's not a comfortable spot for people sometimes, but he's handled it extremely well, and we appreciate your He's my mole in the room. <laughs> Pleased to offer his services. Uh, Councilor Johnson? Yeah, my light's on. <clears throat> no, I really want to say that I'm thrilled and, and honored to be here, and sitting with my first council meeting, I am very excited to be able to work with all of you. This, this is a great group of people, a lot of creative thought, I, I think together we will be able to uh, serve serve the community well, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Caterina. Um, I would um, also welcome Councillors Gleistein and what's your last name? No, Johnson to the to the council. Um, I look forward to working again with the whole group. It, it's you know having been a student of social work and group dynamics and whatever. It's always interesting when you bring new people into the mix of any group, so I'm looking forward to how we can accomplish really good things for the people of the, of the town of Scarborough, because that's really what this job is about. Um, I also had a couple of things to add. If you noticed, I handed out um, clink bags tonight for Project Grace, the heating fuel assistance heating program. We gotta start really thinking about that for people in town. So any donations, it's something we do in conjunction with Project Grace, the town and, and Project Grace together. So donations are uh, accepted at any time. Uh, and just keeping these filled up, especially during the holidays, turning them in is helpful. Um, also with Project Grace uh, and the schools are doing, helping out with this too, we, there's a Thanksgiving dinner uh, at Wentworth on Thanksgiving Day from 11 to 1. Uh, anyone is welcome to come. Um, bring your whole family if you want. You can come by yourself. If We don't want anyone to be alone on Thanksgiving is what it is. It's my understanding that the dinner is really fabulous and I keep trying to get my family to go to that instead of coming to my house. But so far it hasn't worked, but that's okay. Um, they do ask that you RSVP online. You go to Project Grace, uh, Project Grace Scarborough, 
online uh, and RSVP or you can call 207-730-4100. Uh, and if you know anyone who you could encourage them to attend to, if you know they're not going to be around, you know, excuse me, if they're going to be alone or whatever on Thanksgiving. And you don't have to be from Scarborough either. So. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gleising. Uh, well, um, as Ken said, it's an honor to be here, and I really appreciate um, everyone who uh, came out to vote, whether you voted for me or not. Um, I uh, have a lot to learn, and uh, I would ask if you're watching. Um, a lot of folks left, but you know, um, I I would appreciate help, input, support from people in the town, from my fellow counselors, and from the staff. And I have uh, broad shoulders. I take uh, uh, positive input and I take negative input. Uh, you probably learn more from negative input. So that's OK, too. Please reach out to me. I would really appreciate it. And um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Count Councillor Hayes? Yeah, a couple things. One, welcome and congratulations to our new members. Look forward. I kind of echo the comments of everybody else. I'm really excited about this council. I think we're going to have a challenging year ahead of us, but we'll do some good work. So welcome and enjoy and buckle up, I guess, <laughs> going forward. Um, and I'll get on my soapbox just a little. Two, two things. We have the community center seems to be something that's front and center for all of us. And I just encourage everybody that, that on social media, there's starting to be a lot of chatter and a lot of communication. There's a lots of things that are being said that we don't even have a final design. We don't have any numbers. We really don't know what it is. But already there's starting to be things said about unless we fund this as a town, Scarborough teams won't be given preferred spots. So let's, I would just encourage everybody, let's get the information. Let's let all the folks that are working hard in the communities get the information to us. And then we can engage in dialogue. Um, and I would, and as report out on, at least for me, as, as sitting at the front end of the community center, I think we had talked, so far I've seen a lot of the conversation about the numbers being lease numbers, but I think we had stated at the beginning, it's really important that we not only look at lease, we also look at lease to buy, so at the end we own it, and also look at what to build would be. Yep. So, so I hope yep. that's factored into the December 9th. Yep process it should be good yeah good. I guess uh, perhaps they're right I mean our, our end is uh, comparing it to us building it but yes yeah. it, there's that on the community level has definitely been discussed now. But, but but I really encourage on social media that there's been this afternoon it's been a wild storm accusations and people saying things about each other that just isn't let's wait yep let's get the facts and have a, an informed and civil conversation about the facts but just a request for information so December 9th I thought that was just the design review. Is that going to be the design review and finance? I'm going to let Councilor Clucci answer that. Sure, I'll cover yeah. a, a yeah. segue sorry, then. I... Yeah. Oh no, um, it's just a perfect segue. No, I, I I I agree. We there's a lot we don't know, and we are not locked into a lease option. This is evaluating the the financial and practical um, viability of a partnership, and that's what the committee is doing. We expect the developer to come back with pricing on December 9th, and that. Okay. is what we expect that presentation to okay. be. Um, and I think that will be most of the meeting. There will be probably be some back okay. and forth with, with questions. Um, and uh, well, I, well, I don't know. I think I covered everything there. Is that, yes, there's a lot we don't know yet. So, uh, But we have a lot of people working really hard to understand the details and how this might impact taxes or not, how we might pay for it, and all of that. So I want to allow the process to play out. And Paul and I are, are working on an update that should go out this week um, that will hopefully provide some of the history of the work that's been done and relevant artifacts and um, what the next steps are. Um, and I think we're taking a good, uh, deliberate approach to, to trying to evaluate this opportunity. Um, other than that, welcome, Betsy yeah. and Ken. And <coughs> I, uh, I did get to tour the public safety building this morning. and. What an experience. I, uh, you know, it's a source of pride, I think, for the community. And the fact that we're only over budget by a, a relatively small percentage, when you see the quality of the workmanship that's in there is, um, as, as somebody who's gone over budget building things myself, is remarkable. I think uh, um, if you get a chance, you should check it out. And there's going to be some wonderful community space um, in there, additional meeting space that will be available for, for people. So, welcome. Great. Uh, so. 
Actually, before I do my comments, I wanted to thank Mike Foley. Mike Foley was gracious enough. We actually tore, toured Foley's uh, fitness off Haggis Parkway today. Uh, a few of the counselors went out. He is, he, everybody here has an open invitation. Everybody on the community center committee has an open invitation. I think it's valuable to go spend some time with him. So he was gracious enough, gracious enough to show us around the facility. So I wanted to publicly thank him. Uh, congratulations to Councillor Johnson and Councillor Betsy. I think it's going to be great work with both of you. Uh, Councillor Gleistein, you ran, you ran, I give props to campaigns when props are due, and I thought you ran an incredible campaign, so well done. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to thank my fellow councillors for trusting me up here uh, running the meetings. That's, it's quite the calculated risk, but I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you guys doing it, and I promise I'll do my best to only derail once in a while. <laughs> so, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Nicely, nicely done. <laughs> <laughs>